go ahead and take a look at, um, I believe this is page six. So we're going to start off with taking a look at the acceleration of a sneeze and, and what, it, uh, what force produces that acceleration at 2.9 G. So the first thing that's kind of difficult here is a lot of students want to do this. Just go directly into the problem and say, we know that a force equals a mass times an acceleration. So this equation relates a force to mass and acceleration. And they'll go in and say, well, I know that I'm solving for force. So we're leaving that as a variable. We know that a mass is 0.05. And then here's the mistake that most will make. Um, taking this and putting it in for acceleration, which is correct in part, right? It is an acceleration, but remember, in order for us to be able to use this equation, our force has to be in newtons. Our mass has to be in kilograms, so we're good there. Um, and our acceleration it can't be in G's, it's going to be in meters per second squared. So we actually have to convert G's to meters per second squared before we can use this particular formula. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at how we can do that. So in order to convert G's to meters per second squared, think about what one G is. One G is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared of acceleration. So if 1g equals this, then we can set up a proportion and say, well, if 1g equals this, then 2.9 g's must equal this many meters per second squared. So when we go through and do our cross multiplication, we come out with 2.9 g's is equal to the same as 28.42 meters per second squared. So that's what our acceleration is that we'll, we'll be um, using then, 28.42 meters per second squared. So when you end up throwing that in your calculator, 28.42 times 0.05, you're left with 1.4 or 1.42 newtons. And if you're off by a couple of decimals, not a huge deal. And remember to go back and check yourself, then take what you've you found, leave one of the other variables out. So here's my, my check step over here. We know what equation we're using. We're going to use the same equation to check. I know that I've, or at least I think, my force is 1.42 newtons. And now let's solve for one of these other things. So maybe plug in m for mass and take the acceleration that we already know go through and solve. So get m by itself. If it's multiplied by 28.42, we've got to divide by it. If I do it to one side, we've got to do it to the other. I'm going to be left with m equals 1.42 divided by 28.42 rounds off to 0 0.05. What does that number mean to me for my check step? I'll compare it to what was given found out in my check step that mass equals 0.05 kilograms. Problem's telling me that they gave me 0.05 kilograms, so I know that this problem checks out. All right, this is our final answer, however. All right, so take, take a look at number nine. A lot of students have problems with this um, that I've seen in years past and a lot this year as well. Um, it's, it's really easy to get into the trap of we know what a net force is we know what you know if we push an object it's going to accelerate but then to actually stick some numbers to it and know what keywords to pick out is a whole nother story a whole nother ball game so we know that we've got a ship it's cruising at a constant speed constant speed is really 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 key because what constant speed means is zero acceleration no acceleration at all. Well, if we don't have acceleration, we also have no force, no net force acting on an object to cause acceleration to happen. So another way of looking at this is instead of reading it as a ship cruises at a constant velocity, you just say a ship 
is not accelerating as the thrust of the engine is 5,000 newtons. So you may be wondering, well, thrust of the engine is 5,000 newtons. That's a lot of that's a lot of force. Then how the heck isn't it accelerating? Well, it's because there's also another force acting on it. So we could have 5,000 newtons of force pushing it forward. But if there's zero newton net force, that means there's also going to be 5,000 newtons holding our object back. Um, so we know the acceleration because we're at a constant velocity is zero. So then what's the total resistance? Well, we know that our object, if it's being thrust forward with 5,000 newtons of force, and we have zero newton net force, that means there must be 5,000 newtons worth of force holding us back as well to give us that zero newton net force. You may have to rewind this a couple of times and, and look at it. Maybe erase it in your own packet and go back and, and redo it here until it really fully makes sense. All right, so this next problem, I did make a little bit of an error on the page here. Um, rather than um, having this as kilometers per hour, we're just going to change this to meters per second so we don't have to do multi, um, multi-step equations here where we're, we're doing all sorts of conversions from kilometers per hour to meters per second. We're just going to consider it meters per second for now. Get into the other conversions later. So we've got this vintage car. Um, that doesn't tell us anything, right? But it does. But we know that it's got a mass of this. So we know m can go from zero to a hundred kilometers an hour, a hundred meters per second. We're going to say now um, in seven point four seconds. So I have a velocity. And I have a time. All right, we want to know what force is required to do this. So I have time, force, mass, velocity. So how do all these relate? We actually have to go back to an old unit, last unit, to see. So it doesn't explicitly tell me what my acceleration is, but I can figure it out because we know an acceleration is equal to a final velocity minus initial velocity over time. Well, my final velocity, it says it can go from 0 to 100. So my final velocity is where it goes to 100. So that's why I have VF as 100. And I know my initial, it says it can go from 0 to 100. So from 0, 0 being my initial, my initial velocity is zero over here. And then it says in 7.4 seconds. So T is 7.4. And I'm left with acceleration equals 13.51 meters per second squared. And it's really tempting to just leave it here. But remember, just like any other formula in physics, any other problem in physics, we have to look at this and say, well, what does this number mean to me? What does it represent? Is it solving what the problem is asking me to solve? So what this number means to me is 13.51 meters per second squared. So meters per second squared tells me that's my acceleration of this car. So then I've got to go back and look at the problem. Does this make sense in relation to the problem? All right, well, I know I'm looking for a force. I know I've got velocity. I've gotten some time here. So yeah, it seems like it, it makes sense that I'm going to be going for an acceleration. If I've got a force over here and a mass, then I probably want to use F equals MA to solve for the rest of this problem, since that's the formula that's used to relate mass and acceleration. But is it, a, is it solving what it's asking me? What is the force? So no, it's really tempting to leave it here because we've already done our math, but it's not answering the problem. All I've done is found my acceleration, and converted my velocity and time to an acceleration. So now at this point, I'm going to use this acceleration to figure out what my what my mass is, or what my, sorry, my force needs to be in order to get it to accelerate. So we know the mass of the car is 1,529 kilograms. We know the acceleration of the car is 13.51 meters per second squared. So using F equals MA, or my force equation, I can figure out that 1529 times 13.51 gives me 20,000 656.79 or 0.8 newtons and that's what we figured out solving it um, this way as well using a equals f over m and just solving for um, using acceleration directly 
to solve for f that way. And again, if we wanted to make sure that we're correct, which hopefully you do, we'd end up redoing this equation. Insert f, or our force for f, use an acceleration or use a mass, and solve for whichever one we didn't. So maybe use an acceleration of 13.51, solve for the mass, mass should come out to 1529. Work backwards to check, and it will work out. All right, uh, in terms of Newton's second law, why does a heavy and light object fall with the same acceleration in the absence of air resistance? Think, all matter is being pulled down with gravity. So if I've got an object that's made out of two pieces of matter, each one of those pieces of matter is going to be pulled down by gravity. But what happens if I add more matter, more mass? Well, I'm also going to add more gravitational attraction. So I'm just going to continue to increase my mass at the same rate that I'm increasing my pulling force. So no matter what, I'm going to have the same acceleration acting on an object. So it's going to end up reaching the same speed in the air, the same acceleration in the air. Um, now, in the absence of air resistance is pretty key there because if we had an object that continued to get larger and larger and larger, well, it tends to be that the surface area also gets larger. Well, if the surface area gets larger, that means that there's going to be more resistance holding that object up as it's falling down. Well, more air resistance is going to end up equating to less acceleration because there'll be less of a net force in the downwards direction. So that's why it's saying assuming the absence of air resistance. So if there was no air resistance, a feather and a bowling ball would fall at the same rate. Of course, they fall at a different rate because of that air resistance, because the feather has so much more resistance than a bowling ball would. All right, so let's take a look at what terminal velocity is. Um, so what terminal velocity is, and you can of course read it, but let's take a look at it as a, as a picture here. All right, so if I have an object that's got a whole lot of air resistance, as, it's, as it begins to fall, right, this is our force of gravity pulling it down, it's going to accelerate really, really, really fast right now because it has no air resistance. But, of course, objects do have air resistance. So, at first, the force of gravity might be greater than the force of air resistance. So my net force, if we compare the size of our vectors, remember vectors are drawn to scale as much as possible, so I've got a much bigger force pulling down than air resistance acting in the upwards direction or in the resistive direction here since my applied direction or my downwards direction is from gravity. So if I resist that gravity with air resistance my acceleration is going to decrease. What's going to happen with terminal velocity is the air resistance continues to get greater and greater and greater and greater until it reaches the same amount of force as the force of gravity and then an object will stop accelerating. It doesn't mean that it stops in midair. Of course it continues to fall but it just doesn't fall at a faster and faster and faster rate. There's a rate that it's gonna it's gonna reach or speed that it's gonna reach I should say and it's not gonna go above that speed but it doesn't mean that it's stopped. It just means that it's continuing to fall at the same velocity. So it could be going extraordinarily fast, but continuing to fall at that extraordinarily fast speed. So it's just no longer accelerating. And, and that's really similar to the, the reasoning for this particular problem in 13 is very similar to the reasoning for problem 12. If we got a light object, uh, a heavy object, whether that's a skydiver or whatever else, they jump at the same time, they're both gonna hit the ground at the same time, assuming that their air resistance is the same.